Okay. I think that we are streaming live on Facebook. So if you guys are here and you can see us, maybe post in the comments. So I know that you can see us and you can hear us and everything's working well. So welcome everyone to a Facebook Live with the fabulous Tina Peen Bison. Woo! <laughs> I don't always feel fabulous. I feel kind of grungy or grumpy <laughs> or, you know, one of the dwarves. I don't know. <laughs> well, you are fabulous to me. You are fabulous to many people. And oh, I yeah, feel that so way just, about you. I'm so excited to do this with you. Oh, good, good. <laughs> me too. Me too. All right. And I see that we're on Facebook, so that's great. So we'll just give people a few minutes to join. And while doing that, I'll just um, welcome people to Tilt Together because actually there are quite a few new people who joined this group, even just for this Facebook Live today. So thanks for joining us here on Facebook. This is an awesome community of parents, mostly parents, some educators uh, who, who are supporting differently wired children. And it's an incredible, generous community. And if you're new here, you are going to love it. I can pretty much guarantee it. So, all right, we've got a few hellos. So um, I'm Debbie Reber. I am the founder of Tilt Parenting. I'm the author of, I'll just hold up my book, Differently Wired, uh, Raising an Exceptional Child. On my shelf behind me, somewhere up there. I think right oh, see. there, I think. Yeah, I see the spine. <laughs> Although, I just pulled it out to loan it to somebody, so it may not actually be up there. Oh, that's funny. So that's me, Differently Wired, and uh, my podcast, Tilt Parenting, which many of you guys listen to. Tina was a guest uh, last spring, which just feels like a lifetime ago. It does. And uh, yes, so, and let me, uh, I'm going to switch my background here because I have all my little notes on my computer here. I want to give you a proper introduction. Well, you're going to have to show me how to do that. That sounds fancy. It's not as... I used to do this. <laughs> yeah, I have that here, but I don't have my reading glasses on. So, and, and that's a whole other story. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm really excited to be welcoming someone who I know is probably not a stranger to most of you watching this and in this community, Tina Payne Bryson. And I want to just take a moment to formally introduce you. This is the super awkward time when I get to read your bio and you're like, just get like to sit there. Yeah. <laughs> So, all right, let me, let me go through your bio. So Dr. Tina Payne Bryson speaks internationally to parents, educators, camps, and clinicians. She is the co-author with Dan Siegel of two New York Times bestselling books, The Whole Brain Child and No Drama Discipline, along with The Yes Brain and The Power of Showing Up. Tina is a psychotherapist and the founder executive director of the Center for Connection in Pasadena, California. A licensed clinical social worker, Tina graduated from Baylor University and earned her PhD from the University of Southern California, where her research explored attachment science, child rearing theory, and the emerging field of interpersonal neurobiology. Tina has an unusual knack for taking research and theory from various fields of science and offering it in a way that's clear, realistic, humorous, and immediately helpful. Yes, to all of that. That really sums, sums up what you do in the world. And... There's one more thing to add to that bio. Uh, Tina has a brand new book out just this month, two weeks ago now, I think, The Bottom Line for Baby. This is so good, you guys. It, I would have given any amount of money to have this because I was such a research junkie. Like I still am. I love to do research and kind of figure out the right thing and read all the opinions and things. And you've done all of the work for us in this book. So congratulations on this, Thank on your new baby, your newest baby. Yes. And um, someone just gave me a ba bottom line for a baby shower this week. My team, my clinical team, it was really cute. People put pictures of themselves up as babies and they had like pacify. It was really cute. It was really oh, sweet. That's so awesome. It is, it is, like writing a book is like having a baby sort of, right? Like there's um, yes. gestation and labor and delivery. And then you have this thing to celebrate. <laughs> yes. I mean, it is, it really is. And the gestation's often longer than nine months. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> so before we get to questions, I do have some questions from the community and I have some questions that I know my community would want answered yeah. in this moment in, in time in the world. But before we do that, would you take a few minutes and tell us about your book? I'd love to know. I know this is so personal for you and a passion project of yours. So can you share with us why you wrote it and kind of what you hope it does in the world? 
Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's like you, I, I, this was the first book as a parent that I longed for. I, I had a, you know, I had a baby and I was, I wanted to know everything so I could make all the right decisions. And now I put right in parentheses. Um, and, and everything I would read would conflict with it, with the thing I had read before, or I would get advice from people and everybody had a different opinion. And so I just was left feeling a lot of times like I didn't know what the answer was. So um, I really, this book still didn't exist. And so it's an A to Z guide. So it's alphabetical. So you can just flip to like pets. Is it okay to have pets? Is that good for baby? Is it bad for baby? Does it not matter? Um, and it's uh, over 60 topics. And then basically every entry has the competing opinions, like the main arguments or schools of thought on that topic. This next section is what the science says. So I have carefully culled good quality science. Um, and so Sometimes there isn't any, and I'll tell you that. Um, but otherwise, I just do a really quick summary for this pet one. It's only two paragraphs. And then I give a bottom line where I basically say, look, here's what the science leads us to. Um, and in this case, um, family pets are really, really good for children and babies, not only for development of empathy and emotional regulation and responsibility, but also lower rates of allergy and eczema. So I lay that kind of stuff out. And then in about a third of the entries, I have a fourth section called on a personal note. And this is where I either, because I worked hard to objectively report on the science, but sometimes I don't totally agree with it. So this is the section where I get to say, look, here's what the research on this topic is totally missing. They're not looking at the stress states of the baby, or, you know, this, this research is too siloed and they need to include other things. Or I tell a story like, look, I tried tummy time and I put my baby on the floor and his face was just in the rug and he was miserable. So I gave up on tummy time. You know, like sometimes I just tell personal stories as well. My goal and purpose for this book is to one, make it easy for exhausted, overwhelmed parents to quickly within just a couple of minutes. So you don't have to read the book cover to cover, really get empowered about what the science says, if there is something to guide us. And then number two, to understand that there are many, many ways to be a great parent. And that, that there's actually no way it's impossible because some of them are in contradiction with each other to mm -hmm. follow what the science says to do right or perfect for all these things, it's impossible. So I really, my main goal um, besides empowering parents with knowledge was to really empower parents to feel confident in their decisions and use it, you know, you can be like, Mom, read the section on germs. It's fine that I licked my kid's pacifier clean. Read, you know, like we can ward off our unsolicited advice from our right. other people. But really my, my main really goal was for parents to feel um, really confident and empowered in trusting themselves, in trusting their babies and in doing what works for their family and know that there really isn't just one right or perfect way to do really any one of these things. Our decisions as parents matter, they really do, but they don't matter as much as we think they do in terms of like the collective overhaul. So you and your best friend might be doing things totally differently and you can both have kids that turn out really great. So I, I love my favorite thing that someone has said about the book so far is hard science and gentle reassurance um, mm. that I just, you know, we don't, we, we don't have to be perfect. We can't be perfect. And we just need to make our decisions and, and be confident in them knowing that our baby's needs and our needs and our family's needs are going to change over time. And like I said, there are many ways to be a great parent. So whether or not you breastfeed or whether or not you, I mean, all those things matter, they do, but it, if you don't do every single one of the things that's supposed to be best for baby, it doesn't mean you're not a great parent. So there's a lot of assurance in there too. I mean, and this is exactly why I would have given anything to have this book because, you know, I have one child, I, I feel like I screwed up so many things. And I mean, and now I know, right, that a lot of that stuff, it's really all okay. But at the time, I put so much pressure on myself yeah. to do things right. And that was on top of having like a colicky child and all of these things that made parenthood already just like deer in headlights 24 seven. Totally. And what I love about this book is that it is you, you do. I was like, what does she say about circumcision? Like I wanted, like, I really was like, I had, there were a few things I really wanted to know what you had to say. You wanted no to matter, see it, okay. <laughs> yeah. But you like there, there's nothing in there. Like the way that you approach even the most controversial topics 
you can read it and still feel really good about the choice that you've made. And that is such a gift. So yeah, I really hope that parents will not only never, no matter what you decide on any of the topics, even the most controversial ones that no parent will feel judged. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also hope, I guess it's like a secondary hope is that it'll mean we stop being so critical of each other's choices. You know, the mommy wars, which I wish they just called parent wars. Um, you know, oftentimes people get really aggressive and attacking other people. And I think a big part of that is because if someone does it a different way, it makes us worried that maybe we didn't do it the right way, or we get really rigid around. There's one way to do this is only one way. Really the only things that are like that are making sure your baby stays alive. Um, but after that, you know, there's a lot of room for different ways, um, to do it. And I think that we just have to know that people really are, everybody wants to do their best for their children. Mm -hmm. And we don't ever understand the context. Like, I'll just give an example. A friend of mine really wanted to breastfeed. I'm a big breastfeeding fan. I did it for a really long time with all three of my boys. So please don't anyone, what I'm about to say, don't say I'm anti-breastfeeding. I'm pro-breastfeeding. If it works for you, your baby and your family. Um, but I had a friend who really wanted to, but she, her milk supply was so low and she got lots of help, but still no, she wasn't producing enough for her baby. And that already made her feel like a really terrible mom, which had nothing to do with the kind of mom she was. Um, but she was spending so much time pumping and fretting about this that she actually wasn't spending as much time with her baby as she wanted to. Mm -hmm. So not breastfeeding and giving it up made her a better parent for her child in her family because then she was able to really in a more relaxed way be engaged and joyful with her child instead of being so stressed and spending so much time trying to produce milk mm -hmm. so not breastfeeding made her a better mom so that's why don't judge anybody else everybody has a story and what matt there is a bottom line to the bottom line which is the content from the power of showing up which is we need to love our kids fiercely. We need to see and respond to their needs and show up for them when they need us. Yeah. That's it. Boom. And so if you do that, the rest of the decisions, you can go any which way. And that's what our kids need most from us. That's awesome. So, all right. And I just to say someone watching this posted in the Facebook group, this is such a fan mom moment. I'm driving and pulled over to tell you, <laughs> I think you're amazing. Thank you both. So, all right, be safe, Tina, be safe. Okay. Um, be safe. Every so, safe. Safety first. Yeah. I want to do a giveaway about, uh, for this book because I love it so much. So you guys, if you're watching this, uh, if you don't have a baby yourself, chances are you do have someone in your life. My, I have like two pregnant uh, people in my life right now, a friend, a neighbor, a relative, someone, um, who either has a baby or will have one soon. So, um, I'm going to give away three copies of Tina's book. So the way to get entered into my drawing is to leave, is to write a question or a comment in this thread. And then when this is over, I will go through and I will randomly choose three and then I'll reach out to you if you're one of the three. Okay. So you guys oh, nice. post a comment or a question um, for us. So awesome. Okay. So can we shift, uh, shift gears a little bit? Cause I know I've got some. And, you know, really the same idea of like getting competing advice or having being overwhelmed by conflicting, even expert opinions. And by the way, that happens all the time. The two leading world experts on circumcision both say the argument is over. There's only one right way to do this. And it's the total opposite approach. So I think in your community, and I have a kid who's differently wired with a, um, a pain disorder, a chronic pain disorder. His brain is literally differently wired for how he processes pain. Mm -hmm. um, when we're talking about kids who are differently wired, we get so much competing advice, even from the experts, and it can feel so overwhelming. So maybe maybe we should write the bottom line for differently wired kids. I don't totally. know. Um, yeah. But I think that's so relevant to your community, to that same struggle about trying to find the right information and do what's right or do what's best for our family. So I'm so glad to get to talk with your community and answer those questions too. Awesome. And also, yeah, like trusting ourselves, you know, that really? so many of us feel, especially if we've discovered our kids neurodivergence a little later, and then we might regret choices we made. And, you know, we don't trust ourselves because our pediatrician might be saying right. things look pretty normal to me, but we are getting feedback from other communities that no, actually there's, there's some struggles here. So that's a great, great reminder. Now you mentioned the power of showing up that 
Um, that was the last book you co-wrote with Dan Siegel. I love that book. That's the podcast episode we did was about that. And I'll, I'll share the link to that in the thread here. So you guys can listen if you haven't already. I think we were in the early days of COVID. We recorded it in like April. And so here we are <laughs> all these months later. And what I'm seeing from parents in this community, from myself, what I'm experiencing is we are really struggling to show up right now. Um, as you know, we're going back into school and, and we're still like here and, and I'm just wondering, you know, just kind of a, as a way to get started, like, where should we be focusing our energies these days? Like, where will we get the most bang for our buck? If we've, you know, we've yeah. got these kind of competing needs in our families. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the, the magic bullet answer is that there's no magic bullet answer, except I've got two maybe helpful things to say. One is, um, you know, what I keep saying is what your kids need most from you is you. Flawed you, falling apart you, roller coaster you, that's what your kids need most from you. And so the difference between going through adversity and make having it make our children fragile and having them having that experience make them resilient is you as parents, us showing up and being there. That does not mean we are all together all the time. It really doesn't. When we fall apart, when we say, look, I just, I don't have it in me. I need to be by myself tonight. You need to be on your own or, um, or we lose it and we're really grumpy and we're really short tempered, like make the repair with your kid. Say, I'm so sorry. I acted that way. I wish I had handled that differently. Will you forgive me? You make the repair. Um, so really our kids need us. And if we, one of the things that I posted on Instagram, that's gotten a really nice response is that, you know, the world is really hard right now for our kids and for us, but as the grownups, as best we can, we need to be sort of the safe harbor from the storm, but that means we can't be the storm all the time. Right. So, um, that idea of like the world is really hard for our kids right now. We want to be as much as we can the safe harbor um, where they can fall apart with us and we're going to be there for them and comfort them and listen to them and say, I know this is hard. I'm right here with you. I don't know the answers, but I'm right here with you. So I think that's just number one. That's what your kids need most from you is you. Even if you're not perfect and you're messing up, make a repair and just show up for them. That might look like more hugs, more cuddles, even teenagers. It might look like, um, making sure you're having like one thing that can be a huge bang for your buck is play and playfulness. Laughter releases nervous system arousal and stress and tension the same way crying and screaming does. So getting, you know, watching funny videos together, um, doing something silly, getting your kids to cooperate by pretending you're Mary Poppins, you know, those kinds of things. But the other thing I wanna say besides just showing up for them as best we can and when we can't make the repair with them is to think about Something I love to talk about when people come to me, their kids are having major behavioral problems or they have school refusal or whatever's going on, big emotions. Um, I think this is so important to think about for our kids, but especially for ourselves. And that is this, when the demands of a situation are really high and our capacity is not anywhere near as, as high as the demands, when there's a big gap between the demand and our capacity, that's where things are the worst. That's where we get anxious and we get angry and we get resentful, we get depressed, uh, we feel helpless and hopeless. That's when we act out as parents, that's when our kids act out, when they feel that. Um, and I know, I mean, this is something really differently, kids who are differently wired, you've seen it, parents, you've seen, that's some of how we all came to know that our kids were differently wired is the demands of being in the classroom and learning the way their teacher was teaching and the way they were able to have output like that capacity, it was not a match. Mm -hmm. So typically when that happens, when people come to me with their kids like that, I wanna know, number one, we're gonna chase the why. We're gonna peel the layers back and find out why that's the case. It might be that the kid is perfectly capable is at the developmental stage they're supposed to be at and the demands are developmentally inappropriate. It might be that the kid has um, some sort of organic struggle. Um, and, and so we want to find out why that is. But then what I always want to do as soon as possible is to try to get those two things matched as closely as possible. So what we typically do is reduce the demands 
while we build the capacity. And then it's a match. And then our kids don't feel hopeless and helpless and anxious and depressed and angry and all those things. This is so important for us as parents. If you're feeling like, gosh, it's so, so hard to show up right now, think about this. Number one, you as parents, we as parents are being asked to do something that no one has the capacity for. We are being asked to do more than is humanly possible. Right. And, you know, in California, I'm in California and, you know, one of our big saving graces, we can go outside. We can't go outside. The air quality is so terrible. So like one more thing is like taking, taken away from us. Um, so I want us to think about that for ourselves. As a parent, if you're like, I can't show up for my kids. I am totally in survival mode right now. My threat circuitry is activated. I am not doing whole brain parenting. I'm doing like half brain parenting. I'm not doing no drama discipline. I'm doing full drama discipline. Um, <laughs> know that you're not alone. We're all feeling that because our capacity as humans and what's being asked of us are too big of a gap. So for us individually, we should ask, how can I lower the demands on me as a parent? I'm working at full capacity. So that might be saying um, one demand I can lower is who cares if my house is a disaster or I'm not going to make my kid sit that many hours during school. It's torture for both of us. My kid's so dysregulated. They're not learning anyway. I'm going to reduce the demand of the school day load and I'm going to tell the school that's not working for us. Um, maybe you tell your job you need more flexible hours. Maybe you team up with, if you're a single parent, team up with another single parent to become a pod to share some load. So find ways you can reduce the demands on you. Um, and the ways you can think about building your capacity are making sure you're getting sleep, um, having people who show up for you, who's showing up for you and helping you feel safe and seen and soothed. Um, and, and doing something that gives you pleasure every day. Debbie and I, we're not gonna probably share exactly what, but both of us love crappy TV. I'm totally sharing for you. It's fine. Um, one I of no the boundaries. Ways, <laughs> one of the ways like I cope, like last night I watched the town hall for a little while. I couldn't watch the whole thing. I could watch like a third of it. And that was all my nervous system could take. So then I turned it off and I, went to season five of, okay, I am going to disclose, um, <laughs> married at first sight. I'm so, I'm so obsessed with married at first sight. It's junk TV and it makes me happy and it gives me like joy and check out from the world. And, um, so finding ways that you are doing something that is not heavy, that's not demanding of you, that is bringing you joy, even if it's five minutes. Mm -hmm. So reduce your demands, Build your capacity, know that everybody feels like this and you're being asked too much. So don't be too hard on yourself and then show up for your kid as best you can. And I also like to think about this idea of, you know, when your kids like barely ate sometimes and you go to the pediatrician and you're like, he's not eating. And the pediatrician would typically say, look, don't count what you're doing in a day. Count what your kid's eating like over a week or over a month. That's kind of how I feel about the power of showing up. It's the most important thing you can do for your kid, but you don't have to do it every second. Like, is your kid mostly having positive experiences where you show up for them when they have needs? Great, you're doing great. And if you're not doing it this week or this month, you will, or you have, you know, like just be gentle, yeah. gentle. I mean, you guys, I, don't, I hope you're feeling what I'm feeling. Like when Tina says these things, I feel like, it means so much more than when I just read it. So like, because I'm like, okay, if Tina says that this is all good and I have permission to go in my room and watch Love on the Spectrum, which is what I did yesterday for two hours under the covers at like five in the afternoon, because I just awesome. needed to check out, um, then it's okay. So thank you, because I, I, I can feel us all just taking a collective, yeah, like a deep breath of, and just let out that sigh and... I mean, this is really what's coming up again, especially as kids are going back to school is this pressure that we're, the demands we're placing on ourselves and on our kids and we have to get it all right. And what does this mean? And, you know, we can kind of spin, spin pretty far out of control in a short period of time. I, there's two things that, that you said, I just want to touch on one. Um, first of all, when you, I wrote it down, cause I'm going to be using this language. I don't have the answers, but I'm right here with you like that to me is just such a beautiful thing to say. And, and I, I feel like that's the sentiment, what I'm trying to do, but I'm always, I feel like I'm always looking for almost a, 
a resolution. And I think part of this is just knowing that it's okay to just say that and everyone can just have their hard emotions. It doesn't need to be fixed in that moment. And there's something so beautiful about that. I wanted to ask you about what about kids who who make it harder for us to, to kind of show up, who, who may show no interest in us kind of yeah. trying to go in and connect any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, I think first I want to say, and I think we talk about this in the podcast too. So I hope people will go and listen to it. It was incredibly liberating for me once I realized that when my child was having a hard time, I, 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 typically in those moments would spend tremendous emotional and cognitive energy trying to figure it out, trying to say the right thing or do the right thing or to fix it or to let them feel their feelings without distracting them, but also not letting them get stuck in it. Like it's so cognitively demanding when our kids are having a hard time, especially when we're having a hard time, which is all of us right now. So I think it's incredibly liberating to know that when our kids are having a hard time, we don't have to actually do anything. We don't have to solve anything. We don't have to fix anything. We don't have to, you know, change our boundary even. Um, We don't have to come up with any answers or solutions. And a lot of times there aren't solutions or answers or ways to fix it. And so it's incredibly liberating to say, all I have to do in this moment is be present and show up. So I will, I'll say, you know, this is so hard, or you're really upset right now, or if I can even get more clear, like you're, you're feeling really disappointed. Um, is that right? So I try to really empathetically name what's happening. Like, even if it's generic and better with teenagers to be generic, otherwise they'll be like, you don't understand anything. Right. Um, but just to say, this is really hard. I'm right here with you. Just that to say, you know, th- and that's really what we talk about in the conclusion of the whole brain child too, is our job is not to make the world perfect for our children. Our job is to walk with them through the hard things, not fix the hard things, not prevent the hard things, but to really walk with them through it. And when we do that, we actually build their prefrontal cortex and resilience and all of those things. And sometimes kids don't want to feel um, seen and soothed by us. And developmentally, that happens more and more as they move into their teenage years. Um, but also, I, and I think this is probably relevant to a lot of the people in your community. Um, I assume a lot of your um, community are parents of kids who are twice exceptional. We have got a lot of 2E kids. And one of the things I've learned clinically is that often when kids are really bright, um, gifted um, especially, um, they often, when parents go to have a reflective dialogue with their kid about a behavior, the kids can get really dysregulated again. And I believe just based on my clinical experiences that it's because the child has is already thinking through everything they did, what they should have done, they're already being hard on themselves. Mm-hmm. So when we come in, if we're really paying attention and tuning into their experience, when we come in and we say, hey, let's talk about this, you know, I know you know it's not okay to do this or you weren't really responsible in this way, the kid gets pissed because it's basic, it feels like criticism, even if it's like a lovely reflective dialogue, because they're already beating themselves up. And so when we come in, it feels like pile on. So if you try to like have a reflective dialogue with your kid, or you're trying to address a behavior or plan for something, and your kid doesn't find it helpful or soothing, or they're pushing back on your support, I think a really nice, respectful thing to say, at least at the beginning, because they might need, they might need support, even if they're not wanting it, is to say, um, as I'm talking about this with you, I'm noticing it's, it's upsetting you. And so my guess is you've already been thinking about it. um, And you've already been kind of working on it yourself. And if you, if you have or haven't, I trust that you're going to think about what happened and how to do it um, differently next time and let me know if you need some support or suggestions and then leave it. Mm -hmm. Um, When we come in and it feels like criticism, then they go, you know what, talking to my my mom doesn't feel good. It feels uncomfortable and and I feel criticized. And so I don't wanna do that anymore. And less and less they'll come to us. Please don't chase your child to soothe them and give them empathy and be like, I'm going to soothe you and show up for you. If you force it on them, it's actually the opposite of a tune of an attuned showing up response. We're not seeing our children. Then it's more about us and us being rigid about I'm doing this strategy. So when your kids push away, when you're trying to be empathetic, you're trying to soothe, um, 
every kid is different. Every person is different. Every moment is different. Sometimes I want to be left the hell alone. Mm -hmm. um, and my kids do too. And so in those moments, I would just say, um, you know, I would try to engage. And if they pushed back, I would say, um, I, um, I'm, I'm always happy to listen. I'm here. If you need me, I'll check on you in a little while and leave them be. Mm -hmm. And then the main thing is that they know you're available to them. If they want you that's showing up. It yeah. doesn't have to be a force. Like we're now going to talk about all your feelings and you know, it can be, I'm here if you need me. Mm -hmm. That's it. So good. So good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think those are soothing words for people. Okay. I have another question for you. I read an article today, this morning while I was doom scrolling, which I'm really trying to quit doing while I'm laying in bed. Um, but I stumbled upon an article about ambiguous loss this idea that right now we as humans are collectively experiencing a loss that is unclear, that lacks resolution. And it just really resonated with me that we're, we are kind of collectively mourning a loss, the way of life. We don't know how to navigate it because it, we don't know when it's going to end. Like it, there are just no rules really for what we're going through. So I'm just wondering if you have thoughts on how we can kind of cope like some, you, you know, I know what I'm personally trying to do, but any thoughts on how we can cope with this ambiguous loss? Yeah, it's such a hard thing. And I want to explain a little bit of science behind that. But first, I want to say that that doom scrolling thing, I think that was actually that would have been a good answer for me to talk about earlier when I was talking when you were saying when it's hard for us to show up. Um, a lot of us are spending time doing things to distract ourselves from how hard things are, but it actually does not serve us. And I don't mean in the way, like, of course we should sit in our feelings, like what you, uh, what you repress continue. Like, I don't mean like that in the therapeutic way. I mean, like, like, I'm not even saying like, you should feel your feelings and deal with them. I'm not saying that I'm saying like, I'm feeling overwhelmed. So I get on Instagram and I just start scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And when I'm done, I feel even more overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important for us to go, you know what? I just spent 30 minutes doing that. And if I had picked up a book and read for 30 minutes, or if I had um, gone and watched crappy TV for 30 minutes or gone for a walk for 30 minutes, mm -hmm. I would be so much better. So it's, it's even kind of taking a, a big, big view, looking at how am I, when I do those kinds of things, is it better for me or worse for me? Mm -hmm. um, and then trying something different. We're all experimenting with self-care right now because a lot of the things we've done don't work anymore or yeah. we can't do them. So it's, it's always an experiment. Um, in terms of this ambiguous loss, I think loss is the absolute right word. Um, grief is absolutely something we are experiencing and it can be kind of this ambiguous grief, but it can also be specific to things like I'm thinking about when graduation was happening and so many kids and their parents missed out on that rite of passage. And what sometimes it ended up looking like, um, so please be compassionate to other people too, is like there was a whole thing in my community. I'm not going to get into specifics because I don't want to rat out anybody, but there were parents who got really upset about the school's attempts to kind of celebrate the graduates, like putting a sign in their yard. Um, and, um, and they were like, but the sign wasn't very big and it wasn't customized and the other schools are doing customized things. And so this is such a, you know, this is an insult to my kid's graduation and parents were acting out in really petty ways. And I'm like, it's not about the effing sign. Like people were so mad at these parents for being so, you know, like people are hungry. Why are you complaining about a sign? The school's doing their, like people were piling on everybody. And I'm like, it's not about the effing sign. This is grief. Like this parent missed out on this really important, um, you know, thing and the kid missed out on it too. So we have these specific things, but what we need to know is two things about science that we know. One is the way our stress systems are set up is that we are supposed to have a discrete stressor and then recover from it. So let's say you're crossing the street and a truck almost hits you and you're like, oh my gosh, that was so scary. And our heart beats fast. And we have this massive stress response. Our threat system gets activated. And then we cross the street and then we can recover. We're like, oh my gosh, that was so scary. And maybe we're gonna be a little more careful crossing the street. It might you know, make us more attentive to avoiding danger in the future, but we can recover from it what's happening now and even take the i told my husband take the pandemic out for a minute like not even happening everything else that's happening in the world right now is more than we've ever dealt with without the pandemic i mean this is so crazy so what's happening to us is there aren't discrete stressors we can recover from it's like a truck is hitting us every five minutes we can't recover 
So that's part of what's happening. And then we have to know the second piece of science. This there's something called implicit memory. So explicit memory is where I say, hey, Debbie, remember when we did that um, podcast together and we talked about the power of showing up and you remember it and you know you're remembering it. That's explicit memory. You know you're remembering something. Implicit memory is memory that is in that is encoded, but it's not encoded in the same way. Like when I um, go to drive my car, I can drive my car because of memory or associations that my brain has made with how to do something. Um, but when I get in my car, I don't have the feeling like I am now remembering to drive a car. Step one, like it doesn't happen that way. It just happens automatically. And that's how implicit memory works is it's associations that get embedded in our brains, our nervous systems. And the way the brain works is it's an association machine. So anytime something um, gets activated, everything related to that memory or any memory like it can get activated. So what's happening for us right now is when we're feeling um, stress, discouragement, defeat, loss, when we're feeling these feelings, neural networks of every time we've ever felt those feelings are getting activated. So when I am like feeling like my kid didn't get, get to go back to school and this is not what life is supposed to feel like and I feel that grief and loss, it can actually activate. It's like the brain has a call for a neural response. Anything related to this feeling, please get activated. And without us even being aware, a lot of what we're feeling gets dialed way up because we don't know it's also all the crap from the past of other times we felt that way that are getting activated. So one really helpful strategy is to chunk things and to like when we notice we're feeling something like that, when we notice we're feeling like untethered, that's the word I'm using a lot, I feel untethered a lot. Um, when I'm noticing I'm feeling that, I try to go, okay, I'm feeling this feeling what is that feeling about right now in this moment? And then I can kind of like turn the volume dial on all the, the, the excess noise around that feeling from other kinds of things. So part of it is just having awareness when we are aware that we're feeling something and we name it and we get specific about what it is. It actually decreases um, the activation in our brain and our, our whole nervous system arousal. That's a strategy also called name it to tame it. But um, I think just being aware, and for me, what's most helpful is to be aware of my body. So if I do like a little check-in, like set, an, set a an alarm on your phone to go off every day at like three o'clock or something, pick one time during the day, or every time you get in a vehicle or you get on public transportation, or every time you get a refill on your drink or whatever, pick something that's at least once a day. And that is a prompt for you to do a check-in with your body and be like, what am I noticing about my body? And that's gonna allow two things to happen. One, gosh, I'm noticing I'm holding a lot of tension. You know, people are going to the dentist, a lot more dentists are seeing cracked teeth. There was a New York Times article about this because people are clenching their jaws so much. So just start at the top of your head, just kind of do a check-in and notice any kind of tightness or tension. And when you notice it, you can be like, oh, I'm noticing that I'm gonna soften that. And when we actually soften or change our posture or our breathing, it changes our emotions and our thoughts. Um, I don't have time to go into the science of that, but that's absolutely true. If you're holding tension and you sit in a relaxed posture, you're gonna activate anything related to relaxed posture get activated. Hmm. And so not only do we get to notice it and soften it, but what's also great about that is then we can ask ourselves, what do I need right now? So if I'm holding tension in my jaw and I'm noticing I'm clenched, I'm gonna relax my jaw and say, what do I need right now? Oh gosh, I'm a little hungry, I didn't even know it. Or I need to walk away from my screen or I need some fricking peace and quiet. I'm gonna go hide in my car for a minute, you know, or whatever it is. So it's a prompt to do a check-in to say, this is what this is about and how can I solve that problem by mobilizing to do something that I need in the moment. That is so Good. And someone on the Facebook group just said, I went to the dentist, he prescribed a night guard for clenching grinding. I mean, this, I'll just say, you guys, I've been, this is what I've been working on for the past month is this body. Cause I'm realizing I'm super disconnected from my body and it's hard. Like if it's not something you're used to doing to kind of check in and I'm really trying to consciously work on it. And I, and I have been thinking like, I, I don't really feel my, like I can't figure it out. And it was literally like two days ago, I was like, oh my God, I'm your jaw's clenched right now. And so that is the thing where I'm noticing 
And so I love now that action step when you notice it and be like, okay, what do I, what do I need? What does my body need right now? And then following through and yeah, whew, I and mean, just start with your jaw. I mean, I'll tell I have, um, I also have chronic health, chronic pain kinds of things that I've had since my twenties. And, um, I was having chronic headaches and I had done everything. And so, um, this person was like, gosh, I know this physical therapist that specializes in headaches. And I was like, okay, I'll give it a try. And I was like, what's she going to do? And so she, um, she was like, you, do you clench your jaw a lot? And I was like, no, she's like, I want you to notice throughout the day. I want you to just start noticing times you are tightening your jaw. I cannot believe I started just paying attention. Mm -hmm. I held my jaw super tight at night and all throughout the day, I'd just be driving. I'd be fine. I wasn't stressed that I knew of, but I was holding my jaw so tight and that actually changes all this. And it was causing a ton of headaches for me. So she actually taught me this little trick that if you put your tongue on the roof of your mouth and then try to go slack jaw, like let your whole mouth drop, just noticing that you're clenching and then like intentionally, like, you know, stretching your jaw out and then letting your mouth kind of be your jaw be soft. Just that one piece alone will help you start checking in with your shoulders and your stomach and your feet, just doing that body scan, but start with your jaw. Mm -hmm. We have no idea that we're doing it. No. Wow. So crazy. All right. Thank you for that. Um, I have a question that came in, in one of, one of the threads that I wanted to share with you. Um, very specific to this differently wired community, but I'm sure it's, it's will resonate with lots of people. My question is how to respond to consistent rudeness and disrespect from a nine-year-old with ADHD and ODD. I understand how to respond and have had great success with the big lower brain moments but what about just daily rudeness, disrespect to siblings, and sometimes parents? Authoritative parenting didn't work, but collaboration or appealing to his right brain doesn't seem to be working either. Any ideas? Yes. Gosh, that's hard. First of all, that's hard. Mm -hmm. um, let's distinguish between two states that our kids might be experiencing. So in the whole brain child, we call them upstairs tantrums and downstairs tantrums. I know you're not really describing a tantrum, but stick with me for a minute. Um, an upstairs tantrum is where your kid is not totally falling apart. They still have access to their pre prefrontal cortex, right? Their upstairs brain is still on and they can still make decisions. Or if you come up with a solution that works for them, they're like, okay, good. I, so they're still kind of able to tolerate what's going on. They're still able to problem solve and make decisions, okay? The other would be more of a, what we'd call a downstairs tantrum. It's where the lower structures of the brain have really taken over, where even if you give the kid exactly what they want, they will still continue to lose their mind. This is where they've really lost control of themselves. So the reason I distinguish that is because sometimes my guess is that the rude, disrespectful comments are coming in both states. And I would recommend a totally different response based on which state your child is in. So if your child is still in control of themselves, but they're kind of on the edge of it, right? Like they're really um, feeling stressed or they're, um, they're, you know, really kind of um, grumpy and short natured, uh, short tempered in that moment. Um, and they're just being rude, but they are not out of control. What I would do in that moment is super gently say, you may not have noticed, but the way you just said that was kind of rude. So do you want to try that again? It's not a punish, like, so you're not being punitive. You're not attacking or criticizing. You're giving a do-over. And the reason you want to do that is because, you know, the brain is either in a reactive state or it's in a receptive state. If you, every behavior your child has is communication. So mom who asked that, dad who asked that, your child is saying to you, I need skill building and communicating in ways that are respectful when I'm having frustrating feelings or out of control feelings. So your child is telling you, this is a skill I don't have yet. Number one, your child will build that skill better over time, even if you do nothing. It's a brain development thing to a large degree. Number two, um, you want to give your, if the whole point and purpose is to raise a child who is self-disciplined and who in this case speaks respectfully and handles their emotions well, even if they're unhappy with you, even if they're angry that they handle it well then they have to have a lot of skill building while their brain develops in order to do that. So instead of doing something to them that was disrespectful, you lost a privilege, which does nothing to build the skill. It makes them less receptive, less likely to learn. It's counterproductive. 
you want to do something for your child in that moment to help build that skill. So you want to give him a rep, just like you lift weights and you get your muscle stronger. You want to give him a rep for practicing speaking respectfully, even when he's having big feelings. Now, again, this is when he's still in control of himself. So I would say, hey, do you want to try that again? Let's do a do-over. That sounded kind of rude. Um, let's try that again. And if the child refuses, you can say, okay, well, we'll practice another time. I wanted to make sure you knew that that didn't sound very nice. So you're just bringing it to his attention, her attention, and then giving him practice. I would not turn that into a big battle because yeah. we're waiting for brain development to unfold. And you can even in that moment say, and this is going to be more of a downstairs, but you can also say, um, you seem like you're angry with me. I will listen. Full stop. We do too much talking and lecturing, especially when they're in that state and it's counterproductive. So your kid says something rude to you and you say, gosh, you seem angry with me. I'll listen, what's happening? Um, and so you even are receptive and you open it up. Sometimes that works really well. Mm -hmm. If your child is in a downstairs tantrum, let me say one more thing. When your child is not totally integrated and totally like connected to themselves and in their best self, if they're rude to a sibling and you're like, go tell your brother you're sorry, they can't do it because the part of the brain that allows us to feel empathy is prefrontal. And if it's still developing, and if particularly when you have a kid with the diagnoses that your child has, it's a little bit slower to be able to access that even in the moment, even mm -hmm. as it's building. Um, and so if you're like, go tell your brother you're sorry, they can't even access empathy. So we're asking them to do something they can't do in that moment. So we can say, you know, I. I want you to make it right with your sister. Um, and if you're not ready to do that now, I'll come check with you in a little while, right? So we just give it some time. If your child is falling apart and they are spouting stuff at you and they're being really rude and disrespectful to you or to a sibling and they are falling apart, they cannot hear a word you are saying. They cannot learn in the moment. Mm -hmm. Anything you do is that's, uh, if you start throwing out consequences or punishments or threats or lectures, it's going to be counterproductive because it makes them more reactive. So the first thing we have to do is if I want to teach this kid and skill build, he has to be in a receptive state. In the name of discipline, by that I mean teaching and skill building, the first thing I have to do is get this kid back into a regulated state. I have to prioritize regulation. The quickest way to get any human to be regulated and receptive and ready to learn is through empathy and connection. So in that moment, you say, oh, buddy, you're having such a hard time. So he's saying, I hate you. You're so stupid. You should never have been born. You know, I never want to see your face. I mean, just really rude. And you say, oh, buddy, you're having such a hard time. And that's an another great time to say, I will listen or how can I help? Mm -hmm. Now, people get mad when I say this sometimes because they're saying you're rewarding bad behavior. This is permissive. No, no, no. We are being strategic about getting our child to a receptive state so they can learn, so we can address the behavior, so we can hold them accountable. So it's not permissive, it's strategic. Mm -hmm. We're going to absolutely, your kid's not, they're going to blame you and everyone else if they are not in a receptive state when you address the behavior. you got to get them regulated first. And then you can say, you know, when you said that to me, that was really unkind, that hurt my feelings. And you pause and you let them feel what that feels like when you say that far less talking. And if your child is back in a regulated state, they will often apologize automatically. Mm -hmm. And then you know it's something that, that they can't help sometimes in the moment. When we are falling apart, we can't help it sometimes. So in that moment, you're going to do tons of connection, empathy. I'm here just like when your, your child was a baby and they were crying and you soothed and comforted them. That's what your child needs in that moment. At your child's worst, that is when they need you the most. Mm -hmm. You're still going to address the behavior, but first you're going to soothe, get them connected so that they can then move into getting those reps to build those skills over time. Mm -hmm. So good. And I just want to acknowledge too, for people watching, this is not easy to do and it takes lots of practice and there will be plenty of opportunities for said practice and also plenty of opportunities to practice repairing when we yep. don't respond in the way that we would want to. So it's not easy to be, you know, I think a lot of us feel like we are, especially the primary caregivers, the people who are in this group who are kind of the most engaged and invested with their kids are often the ones who are the receptacles for this tough energy. And so I just want to acknowledge how hard this is, but 
but what a gift if, mm-hmm. if you can kind of show up in that way. So just so many awesome takeaways. Um, and you know what I want to say too, that yeah. it's hard, it's super hard and we have to be regulated first. So ask yourself, am mm-hmm. I ready to teach? Is my child ready to learn? And if the answer right. is no, it's not the time. Right. But if you practice parenting this way, you will see it works far better mm-hmm. than the other stuff, but it gets easier over time because we start getting reps. It becomes your automatic. It's hard, yeah. but it does get easier. Yeah. A hundred percent. We have one more question that came in that I just went up ahead of time and then we'll wrap up because you, I know you've been so kind of just all over the place um, on social media and tons of interviews. So again, thank you so much for taking the time oh, to stop buddy. by today and just sharing such generous, amazing insight with us. So this is kind of also a very unique question, but I know there's going to be something in here for everyone who's listening. My son has been having this unexplained fear of women and girls in shorts this summer. He cries and screams almost every time he sees them. Sometimes he manages to get a hold of himself. He's language delayed. He's five and a half, but he speaks more like a, like a three-year-old. How can I support him to get through this difficult phase that has affected our, our lives so much? I loathe going for walks with him lately. Interesting. Yeah. Sometimes kids have um, fears, phobias, reactivity around things like, I mean, I've heard all kinds of things like buttons, you know, zippers, um, you know, plants. I mean, like kids have these kinds of things from time to time. And it often does happen when a child is language delayed or there's been some sort of trauma or something like that. (coughs) Excuse me. Sometimes parents are like, but I don't know why, like this kid has not had shorts trauma. Right. Um, And sometimes I really believe, and this is kind of weird to say, but I think sometimes kids have nightmares that actually are a source of some of their big, huge phobics, phobic fears. Um, So don't assume as a parent, your child has had a trauma or that there's been something concrete that would explain it. It might be from a nightmare that they had. Um, The best way, my my favorite resource on this is a book by Lawrence Cohen called The Opposite of Worry. And the whole book, it's really guided a lot of my clinical work with kids who have significant fears, is when we are in a state of play or playfulness, it's the opposite um, neurologically of being in a threat state. So if your child has like this, you know, big threat response when he sees this, what we want to try to do is create um, play or playfulness in a way that is a, that, that he can stay in his window of tolerance around that exposure <coughs> so that he starts creating new neural associations of safety and not a big deal with that. So um, if you guys can make shorts, don't even necessarily call them shorts, I'm just making this stuff up. So you'll come up with lots of examples, but um, take a dish towel and make shorts for teddy bears. Um, uh, so you're, you're kind of like putting shorts on something that's fun or playful. Um, another thing you can do is do a story. So you can um, write the story down, make, just make it on paper or on the computer, um, and you tell the story. This is from the Name It to Tame It strategy in The Whole Brain Child. But basically you list the facts, like when Max sees um, moms or girls wearing shorts, um, he can have big feelings. He can feel and ask him, like, see if he can contribute. And you, you basically write out what are the facts, what are the feelings, and then the third part of the story is what to do or a strategy that will help him. So one of my suggestions, and there can be many, many of these, is ask him, um, does he know about a brave animal? Is there a brave animal? He might not be able to come up with it, but you can give him a couple of options. Is an eagle really brave or is a bear really brave? Come up with an animal that's brave. Um, and then you can actually draw on his little arm, or if you get, if you want to, you can order temporary tattoos off of Etsy f- of that animal, but put a little, um, a picture of it and be like, this is your brave animal. Um, and so if we go outside and we see shorts, you can put your hand on your brave animal and you can feel braver. Another thing you can do is a more bottom up strategy using the body, having him um, hold it. So what does your body and face look like when you're afraid? And you get scared and he'll, you know, he can show you and then you do it with him. And then you say, what does your body and face look like when you're brave and his shoulders will go back, his face will come up, his feet will be firmly planted. You do it as well. Um, And then you can, and then you have him hold his body in a brave posture because that also activates a neural network of, I feel brave and I feel confident. 
Um, and so then when you start your walk, we're going to be brave soldiers going for a walk. We're going to be brave bears looking for our friends, you know, that kind of thing. Use play strategies with that. If you can have him hold his body in a brave posture, it will probably decrease his reactivity and his fear. So those are some strategies to try. If they don't, um, if it doesn't start getting better using play strategies, I would highly recommend working with a play therapist who can um, help you with some of those kinds of things. Sometimes even occupational therapists can help um, with these types of things, activities of daily living, like going outside and seeing people in shorts, um, while providing specific sensory inputs mm -hmm. that help him be more regulated when that happens. But the goal is to create new neural associations. Oh, I just thought of one more. I know we're going late on time, but my nephew one time was terrified. He was four. He was terrified of a mummy that lived in his bathroom. I tell this story in The Whole Brain Child. Um, and he was like, Auntie Tina, I know this boy's a liar because he said an octopus lives in his bathtub and I know that an octopus needs salt water. So I know this boy's a liar, but I'm afraid anyway. And he said that there's a mommy that lives in my bathroom. So what I encouraged my nephew to do was to take control of whatever was scaring him. So what I had him do was get a dry erase marker that could have be erased off of the mirror and he made his own bathroom mummy. So he drew a mummy on the mirror in his bathroom. And I said, Liam, your job is every time you go into the bathroom, you have to add something funny to your mummy. So when he would go and it was his bathroom mummy, he named him, he was four. So he drew body parts on the mummy and mask and snorkel and flippers and you know a shark that was biting his shoulder. And every day it got funny and funnier. So what, what we were doing is what I'm encouraging you to do is to create a new neural association of silliness or play or safety around the thing that scares them as opposed to fear. So he was able to take control of the fear by making it his mummy, making it silly and playful. So you can even like make shorts puppets and give them names and funny faces. So just creating new neural associations is really kind of what you're going for. Awesome. Wow. That was such a good answer. So much, so many nuggets for, for all of us. <laughs> Tina, thank you so much. This has just been so wonderful and fun for me personally. And uh, I know that we've just had more and more people joining us. So thanks to all of you guys who've been showing up. I want to just take a, one more minute to remind you guys, this is Tina's new book, The Bottom Line for Baby. It's amazing. So think about who in your world and life might need this right now. Tina, where should people connect with you? Where are you kind of directing people these days? Yeah, my website is tinabryson.com. Um, and the place I'm posting the most material right now is on Instagram. And my handle there is Tina Payne Bryson. Awesome. And um, for you guys who are interested in tilled parenting, I wanted to just give you a heads up that next week, the doors to the Differently Wired Club, which is my membership community. They will be open just for next week and for the last time in 2020. So if that's something you're interested in checking out, you can sign up at tiltparenting.com slash club for my little interest list. And then I'll, you'll make sure to get notified when, when I share all the details next week. So and Debbie, really, if I, yeah. if I, I'm going to post this on my, my stuff too. So if, if people, if my followers want to find you, where can they find you? TiltParenting.com is like the home for everything and also on Instagram, here, Facebook, and yeah, I'm, I'm at all the places at Tilt Parenting. Thank you so much. Great. Awesome. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This was super fun. Tina, I hope you can get some rest and I hope the air clears up out there soon so you can get outside again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Debbie. All right. Good to see you. You too. Bye.